If you're watching this channel, then you're a big music appreciator, and you probably have more than a few albums that you love that seemingly nobody else does. I've definitely got more than a few of those. So coming up on the channel today, I'm going to talk about five albums that are pretty unpopular that I love coming right up. It's Russ from the Infectious Groove Podcast and Vinyl Channel. And as I said in the intro today, I'm going to talk about five albums that are pretty unpopular that I love for a variety of reasons. If you haven't already, if this is your first time seeing the channel, uh, please hit the subscribe button below. Uh, if you're not subscribed to the channel and you like what we're doing here, at least drop a like on the video. That helps us out a great deal. And you can also hit the link in the description below and join our Facebook Vinyl Discussion Group if you want to. Let's get to the matter at hand. Like I said in the intro, if you're watching this video, you more than likely have albums that you love that for whatever reason no one else does or didn't sell a lot or are known as the, uh, the black sheep in that artist's catalog. And uh, these here that I'm going to share today are five that I absolutely love uh, off the top of my head when I pulled these records. I don't think there's a track on most of these records that I don't like. And for whatever reason, they all fit the bill of what I said about being uh, either unpopular or the black sheep in the artist catalog and uh, or just don't get anywhere near the recognition I feel that they deserve. So let's get right into it. The first one that for me almost always pops into my head when people talk about uh, underrated albums or albums that don't get the love that they deserve is uh, the final studio record from Van Halen, A Different Kind of Truth. I think this record is amazing. And I understand that they may have alienated a certain part of their fan base uh, by bringing David Lee Roth back for an entire studio record, uh, as opposed to all the fans of Sammy Hagar. Uh, I understand that they further alienated another uh, whole section of their fan base, maybe even more than the Van, uh, Sammy Hagar fans with replacing uh, Michael Anthony on bass instead of uh, with Wolfgang Van Halen. Uh, having said that, if you put all of that stuff aside and you just listen to this record, uh, first of all, Edward and Alex are on fire. I would argue that this is some of the best playing Alex or Eddie Van Halen has done on any Van Halen record, and it's constant on every single song. Eddie is just on fire. Even for Edward Van Halen, he's on fire above what he usually is. Uh, Alex does some of his best drumming in the history of the band on this album, if you ask me. Uh, I don't really want to get into the, the Michael Anthony debate, but I think Wolfgang Van Halen does a fantastic job on the backing vocals. And, uh, of course, on his bass playing, he matches up to everything his dad and his uncle are doing. And then David Lee Roth is David Lee Roth. He's going to sound the way he does on vocals. It's more uh, talking than singing. Uh, but his vocals, David Lee Roth has always had a very clever turn of phrase with his uh, vocals. And on this album, he's, again, lyrically, he's on fire. There's some uh, stuff that looks frivolous on the surface. And then when you really listen to the way he's making his, uh, his rhymes happen, his verses, and what he's actually saying... It's just a tremendous uh, work from David Lee Roth that he contributed to this record. So uh, Van Halen, Different Kind of Truth, definitely one that I would say is, uh, needs more love, and it's an unpopular album that I love. The next one, as of the shooting of this video, it has never been on vinyl, uh, so hopefully the uh, cover art's going to show up right here over my shoulder. That's the plan. And that is the album that uh, Garth Brooks did as Chris Gaines. Uh, it's even known by a couple of different names. It's kind of confusing. It's known by either Chris Gaines' Greatest Hits or uh, Garth Brooks in the life of Chris Gaines. And there's so much to unpack with this record that I'm not even going to get into uh, details of as far as uh, it was supposed to be a soundtrack for a movie and there was some confusion on whether Garth thought he was Chris Gaines and the SNL appearance where he introduced himself or Garth introduced himself as uh, Chris Gaines. Again, and you're going to find this as a reoccurring theme with a lot of these records that I'm going to share, is if you put all of that aside and you just put on the album Chris Gaines' Greatest Hits or Garth Brooks and the Life of Chris Gaines, the whole record is absolutely fantastic. There's really, really, really good pop and R&B and uh, rock-ish songs on the album. Uh, it's produced by uh, Babyface. A lot of the songs were written uh, by Kenneth Edmonds and uh, along with Garth and, of course, a team of songwriters. Uh, 
and uh, it's just fantastic good pop music garth delivers a great vocal that's totally different than what he's used to on almost every song except for uh it doesn't matter the sun uh, which just sounds like garth singing garth but the entirety of the rest of the record uh he really does something completely different vocally than he'd ever done before uh now, I say this isn't on vinyl right now because Garth Brooks himself has alluded to the fact that uh, when we do get more Garth Brooks vinyl uh, coming soon, apparently, the Chris Gaines album is not only supposed to be included in that, but we're supposed to be getting some extra tracks and things like that as well. So uh, Garth Brooks and the Life of Chris Gaines, Chris Gaines' Greatest Hits, whatever you want to call it, I definitely think that record deserves uh, more love, and it's, it's I'd almost call it hated, and uh, I love it. I love every track on it. The next one continues my theme of, uh, if you put all of that aside, <laughs> this is a great record. And uh, it's 2008's Chinese Democracy. And when I say uh, put all that aside with the history of Guns N' Roses, I say this record came out in 2008. It should have come out in 1999, 2000, 2001, 2006. Uh, well, it finally appeared uh, to us in 2008. And there's even a ton of debate over what ended up on the record as opposed to what could have. Again, I'm talking about putting this album on right at the start and going straight through. I think this album deserves a lot more love than it gets. Uh, this is one I'd kind of like to hear some comments on in the, in the uh, comment section below. I find that when I discuss this record with people, anytime somebody initially says, oh, I don't like Chinese Democracy, I almost always find that when I ask, what is it you didn't like about the record, uh, it comes out that they actually never gave it a chance, or they heard maybe one song, uh, or someone told them that it was bad. Uh, I think this is an absolutely fantastic record. Again, do I think it's justified that it took so many years and so many millions of dollars and so many people are playing on it? I'm not here to discuss that. I'm here to discuss when you drop the needle on this record or push play on streaming from the title track, Chinese Democracy, that kicks it off all the way through to the finishing track, Prostitute, there's really not much to dislike. There's a lot of things that sound far different than what you're used to from uh, the title Guns N' Roses being on an album. And there is uh, quite a bit that sounds the same as what you're used to. Uh, but all the way across the board, I think this is a great record that doesn't get anywhere near the love that it deserves. And it's just flat out unpopular. And I just don't think that it should be. Next up on the list is uh, somebody you would never think would have an unpopular or uh, underrated record. And that is King of Pop, Michael Jackson. And uh, his last effort with us before he passed away in 2009 was this album here from 2001, uh, Invincible, a commercial flop in every sense of the word, which is, uh, again, another one that qualifies for, I don't want to get into all of that. I'm talking about just the music. An absolutely great effort from uh, the King of Pop and uh, a modern sound for that era, 2001. Uh, some of my favorite Michael Jackson songs are on this album. Uh, two of my favorite ballads, to be sure, Speechless and Butterflies, are on this album and just just incredible ballads. Um, Michael not losing a step vocally, uh, certainly not uh, melody-wise. Uh, it's just an absolutely great album from a great artist. And uh, because of when it was released in 2001 and uh, his battles with Sony uh, as a corporation and as his record label, uh, you could argue the, pro the record was just completely buried uh, promotion-wise. Uh, and so it's one that's really unpopular, even among Michael Jackson fans. But uh, I absolutely love it. I think this is a, a great record that uh, do definitely deserves more attention than it gets. The last one that I'm going to uh, show is an artist who many people revere for their en enormous creativity. But it's an artist who many people feel like maybe uh, overplayed their hand or put out too much material. And because of that, I feel like this album really got lost in the shuffle uh, for the quality that it is uh, kind of got overlooked. And that is uh, Prince's effort, Rave Unto the Joy Fantastic. This album, I personally would put up in the discussion with some of the greatest works Prince ever made. And uh, there may be Prince fans watching this video who uh, totally disagree with that. I've had discussions with Prince fans who say, I can't believe you love that album as much as you do. Uh, again, this is similar to Michael Jackson. This is, for me, this is Prince doing everything Prince does 
exactly right. Uh, it's funky. It's guitar driven. There's um, amazing ballads. The Greatest Romance uh, Ever Sold is one of the best Prince ballads around. Uh, there's an album closer on here called I Love You But I Don't Trust You Anymore that is, again, one of my favorite Prince ballads. Uh, there's even a cover of uh, Every Day is a Winding Road by uh, Sheryl Crow on here that is absolutely great. And Sheryl Crow appears on this album, but she's not even on the cover of her own song. She uh, appears on a rock track called Baby Knows that is great. Uh, Gwen Stefani makes an appearance on this record on another great rock pop song called So Far So Pleased. Uh, it's just a really, really good Prince album that not only didn't get the recognition it deserved when it was uh, released initially, but even now after Prince passed away and people seemingly... Uh, gobble up everything they can get from artists as soon as they pass. This was uh, reissued on vinyl very quietly and uh, no one ever talks about it. It's not something you see posted around uh, any sort of vinyl discussions and people say, oh, I love that. It just tends to be a really unpopular album and it's puzzling to me. So with these videos, I'm always more interested in uh, the discussion and anything. If you don't like uh, any one of these albums, great. Um, but what I would like to hear from everybody in the comment section below is albums that you love that are not popular. Um, again, whatever qualifier you need, uh, or even maybe albums that are kind of popular, but uh, you think should have been even bigger than they were, something along those lines. That's what I'm looking for with this. And if nothing else, maybe uh, if anybody wants to give one or more of these albums a second try, or maybe even a first try, uh, I'd love to hear what you think afterwards in the comment section below. Uh, we love making these videos, love sharing the collection and all of our thoughts on music uh, with everybody out there. If you're subscribed, thank you. If you drop a like on the video, thank you. If you get involved in the discussion, thank you. Uh, no matter what, I always say thank you so much for watching. <laughs>